And now I think we'll start our slides. Amazing. So we are going to start with a brief uh, biography of Michael Richards. Michael Richards, while we look at um, these really wonderful images on a contact sheet from the Studio Museum in Harlem's archives, which we're really grateful for. Michael Richards was born in Brooklyn, New York in 1963 and raised in Kingston, Jamaica. His mother was Costa Rican, his father was Jamaican, and he really came of age between post-independence Jamaica and a post-civil rights era United States. He returned to New York for school, earning a BA at Queens College in 1985 and a master's in fine arts at New York University in 1991. Richards really intentionally pursued his artistic practice through artist-centered nonprofits and museums, as well as fellowships, grants, and artist residency programs. Notably, um, in this pursuit between 1992 and 2001, he participated in the Whitney Independent Study Program, the Bronx Museum's AIM Fellowship, the Studio Museum in Harlem's Artists in Residence Program, and Art Center South Florida's Studio Program, of course, now Ule Arts, Simultaneously, he was also exhibiting his work both nationally and internationally, also at the Studio Museum, Bronx Museum, as well as the Miami Art Museum, now PAM, the Aldrich Museum, and the De Bayard in the Netherlands, among many others. Tragically, Michael Richards passed away on September 11th, 2001. He had been working in his Lower Manhattan Cultural Council Worldview Studio, on the 92nd floor of World Trade Center Tower One um, when he lost his life along with thousands of others on that day. Richards was integral uh, to a generation of black artists who were emerging in the 1990s, including Renee Cox, Lyle Ashton Harris, Carrie James Marshall, Dred Scott, and Kara Walker, among many others, whose powerful artworks confront the realities and consequences of racial injustice and amplify the complexity of Black identity. We'll now move into a little orientation around the exhibition. And because this is a virtual tour, um, we wanted to begin with what you would see as you approach the museum, which is this beautiful banner with a detail of the title artwork and a prompt to audiences, are you down? When, when we then enter the MOCA lobby and the first image that viewers encounter is a big beautiful photo of Michael Richards smiling widely um, in Miami Beach as well as a 30 minute documentary uh, directed by Dennis Scholl and Juan Matos, edited by Marlon Johnson and produced by Dennis Juan and Ulite Arts who have been incredible partners. Then viewers turn to see the introductory text on the exhibition's signature honeyed yellow wall. And we enter the gallery from there where you can see that the floor plan of the exhibition is really open in order to give these powerful artworks a lot of space. As Alex noted in our curatorial process, we center Michael Richards voice first and foremost the exhibition begins with an artist statement from Michael Richards, which we found uh, in the Bronx Museum archives in Michael's artist file. And we believe this statement is from the mid to late 1990s. We are going to read it out loud for you as we uh, center ourselves in Richards thinking throughout this tour. Go to the next. Perfect. So Michael Richards artist statement. Does the glass ceiling, which excludes, also reflect the desire to belong? My current body of work investigates the tension between assimilation and exclusion. By focusing on issues of identity and identification, I attempt to examine the feelings of doubt and discomfort which face Blacks who wish to succeed in a system which is structured to deny them access. How do systems of representation and the portrayal of success both seduce and repel? I wish to give voice to the psychic spaces in which exist both hope and frustration, faith and failure, and the compromises which must be negotiated in order to survive. 
Though the issues which inform the work may be seen as primarily political, I use the language of metaphor to express them. The use of feathers and tar, mirrors and ladders, the concept of flight as both freedom and surrender, all attempt to open a, metaf a metaphorical space into which the viewer can be seduced. This space allows for an examination of the psychic conflict, which results from the desire to both belong to and resist a society which denies blackness, even as it affirms. In attempting to make this pain and alienation concrete, I use my body, the primary locus of experience, as a die from which to make casts. These function as surrogates and as an entry into the work. So now we'll walk through various sections and artworks in the exhibition. An initial section of the exhibition represents Richard's early installation work from 1990 to 1993. These are the earliest works represented in the show. In these early works, Richard's created room size site-specific installations directly contending with the historic and ongoing causes and consequences of anti-Blackness. Specifically, these installations address histories of the transatlantic slave trade, as well as the racial violence of blackface minstrel performance. While these artworks appear to no longer exist, we've included installation images enlarged from 35 millimeter slides to provide an opportunity to view Michael's early artistic vision. Moving from Richard's early installation work, by the mid 1990s, he began to shift his practice from room size installations to more autonomous sculptures. So in a sense, Richard starts to distill these larger scale artworks into tighter sculptural forms. The first sculpture at the entrance to the exhibition, A Loss of Faith Brings Vertigo, reflects this transition to sculpture in Richard's practice. A Loss of Faith Brings Vertigo is also the first artwork in which mm -hmm. Richard's more directly address contemporary political contexts, specifically the Los Angeles Police Department's brutal beating of Rodney King. As noted in his artist statement, Richards cast the majority of his sculptures from his body, and the bust-like heads of this sculpture are cast from Richards' face. The next slide um, shows that Richards then photo transferred images of white police officers in confrontational postures, outfitted in riot gear, on the faces of the four outermost figures. One of the images pictures these police officers physically arraigning a black man. The plaques on the four outermost busts read, when I was young, I wanted to be a policeman. The fifth and central disembodied head spins via a motor and in the middle of the forehead is an image of Rodney King's face. The plaque on this pedestal bears the title phrase, a loss of faith brings vertigo. With King at the center, the narrative of Richard's sculpture is one of a loss of faith in the police and the disillusion of their relationship to safety and protection. The slow spinning head enacts this disorienting feeling of vertigo in response to racially motivated police brutality. During our contemporary moment, in the face of persistent police brutality, the continued murders of Black people at the hands of police officers, and the responsive Black Lives Matter movement, a loss of faith brings vertigo continues to have urgent and pressing resonance 25 or over 25 years after its creation. We'll now move from this sculpture back into the space and Melissa will talk through two other artworks from Michael's transition to sculpture. Noted. Sorry, thanks Alex. As Alex noted, the years 1994 to 1996 were a really significant transitional moment for Michael Richards as he began to create these more autonomous sculptures. It was also a time of immense experimentation with form, material, and content. Um, moving from a sculpture like A Loss of Faith Brings Vertigo to our next uh, work, which is titled Swing Low, demonstrates just how wide ranging Richard's practice became during this time. 
Richards created Swing Low during his residency at the Studio Museum in Harlem, uh, which he participated in from 1995 to 1996, and where he worked alongside artists Shakaya Booker and Richard Lewis. The title of this work directly references the African-American spiritual Swing Low Sweet Chariot, as well as lowrider car culture. Swing Low consists of a rusted biblical or Roman chariot, as you can see, with one wheel attached to its right side, and it is also outfitted with a blue neon underglow and a booming speaker system, which when installed blasts 1990s era dance hall music, which we will hear a little bit of in a minute. Um, we like to say that Swing Low contains multitudes as did many of Richard's works um, from its wide ranging visual references to its joyful sound element. This work offers earthly escape through a sonic transmission of Jamaican culture and music. Swing Low is also a really perfect example of how Richards often merged worlds in his artworks. Here he's bringing together uh, spiritual and historical references with popular culture, demonstrating this recurring interest that was in both the everyday and the transcendent, and how bringing them into conversation with each other opens up a plurality of representation and interpretation. Notably, this installation of Swing Low at MOCA is the work's first public display since Richard's 1996 Studio Museum Artists in Residence exhibition. And huge thanks, again, it takes an entire community to do this work. Huge thanks are due to Michael Richard's friends, William Cordova and Luis Gispert, as well as Rudolf Kahn, who um, took a lead role in the restoration of Swing Low. The playlist for Swing Low, which is available on MOCA's Spotify page, and we'll put a link in the chat, comes from a mix CD given to William Cordova by Michael Richards in Miami in 1999. And we will play about 30 seconds of the song Bomb Bomb by Shaka Demas and Pliers so you can get a sense of the work in action. <laughs> to another recently conserved and multi-layered work. This is Climbing Jacob's Ladder, He Lost His Head. This is, as you can see, an ethereal, stunningly beautiful, and also painful work. And we can flip to the next slide, um, and even the next one, actually. Um, Climbing Jacob's Ladder brings together Richard's interest in religion and spirituality with the story of Jacob, representations of blackness with toppled heads and stacked feet cast from Richard's own body, and finally contends with minimalism, specifically Donald Judd through the shelves stacked on the wall. I've just noted two instances of works being restored and exhibited for the first time since Michael's passing in this exhibition, and there are two more that we'll also point to during this tour. Um, the legacy stewardship and conservation efforts are really central to our curatorial process and, of course, to the realization of this exhibition. We can go to the next slide. The first time that Alex and I encountered Michael Richards' artwork was in his cousin Don's garage, which you can now see here. And this was in 2016, um, which is when we first had the idea to research and exhibit Richards' work. Don very generously and openly invited us into her home in upstate New York, where she had been storing and caring for unopened boxes of sculptures, ephemera, drawings, um, and more for nearly 15 years at that time. So on the left, you can now see a very full garage, which this picture was taken in early 2016. You can see both boxed and exposed artworks, of course, including Swing Low, which you just saw so beautifully restored. Um, 
these works have now literally become the exhibition that we're walking through today. And as you can see on the right, uh, just this summer, uh, we brought the rest of the sculptures to our conservator, have shipped them to Miami, and now the garage is practically empty. The second phase of our research process moved from the works themselves in Don's garage to analog research at institutions that supported Michael in his lifetime, including the Bronx Museum of the Arts and the Studio Museum in Harlem. When we started the process of curating Richard's art in 2016, there was very little information about his work online. Only after locating 35 millimeter slides in his artist files at these institutions were we able to understand how to reconstruct uh, motorcycles outside. Were we able to understand how to reconstruct the artworks from elements Dawn had stored in her garage? Michael was an artist and collab. Michael as an artist and a collaborator really comes through in the artist files. You can see that in this handwritten note here to then curator at the Bronx Museum of the Arts, Marisol Nieves. In the image on the left, you see one of the 35 millimeter slides, which depicts airfall. One, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he's watching me. The sculpture consists of 50 airplanes wrapped in synthetic hair, spiraling downwards from a cloud of hair towards a bullseye target on the floor. Only when we located slides were we able to know how to install the artworks as Michael had in his lifetime. So he said, oh, this box of 50 toy airplanes wrapped in hair in this corner of the garage goes with the mirrored bullseye target that's in this part of the garage with the cloud of hair that was in another part of the garage. So um, we really use these installation images from Michael's lifetime as the central guiding resource as we aim to represent his works now as he did throughout the 1990s. It's important to mark that as two white curators stewarding the legacy of a black artist who's no longer with us, We've developed an approach that aims to center Michael Richards' voice as much as possible. For example, the wall labels in the exhibition quote Richards' interviews and his artist statement at length, and his own words comprise about half of the exhibition text overall. We've also centrally engaged Richards' community of friends, artists, and curators to bring Michael's artistic vision to the fore as much as possible through the lens of his life. Our curatorial aim has been to bring Richard's artworks back into exhibitions through extensive conservation, as well as the context that he was addressing directly in his lifetime. We'll move next into the section, drawings and works on paper. In addition to being a skilled sculptor, Richard's was an avid draftsman, which is an aspect of his work that's lesser known. As with his sculptures, Richard's drawings explore the complex charge of recasting objects language and the body. Imagery including hair, targets, ladders, and wings represented in Richard's sculptures are iterated in his drawing practice. Here we've included over two dozen drawings in the exhibition. Created over the course of five years from 1996 to 2000, Richard's escape plan series pairs intricately rendered images with poetic and provocative text describing thwarted plans for escape often invoking widespread racial stereotypes and the prejudices they reinforce. So we'll show three of these drawings closer up. Michael Richards' Escape Plan 12, I'll read the text. On the far left, it says, he dreamed that if he re reached for the stars, his arms would grow and lift him out of captivity. But those who saw him thought he was merely surrendering. The middle, middle Escape Plan is Escape Plan 96 a ladder made of chicken bones and watermelon glue. And the final escape plan that we are including in the exhibition, Escape Plan 100, has no text, but has a drawing in Michael's hand of a lotto ticket. Michael prominently exhibited his drawings alongside his sculptures in exhibitions in his lifetime, such as his Studio Museum in Harlem Artist in Residence exhibition in 96, and his Corcoran Gallery of, the Art, Corcoran Gallery of Art exhibition in 2000. Um, the exhibition at Ambrosino Gallery in North Miami in 2000, literally across the street from Mocha, North Miami, was titled Escape Plan 2000 and featured dozens of Michael's drawings. It feels really meaningful to be able to include these drawing practice, this drawing practice in the exhibition. And in tours that we've given of the show, people who saw the drawings show 
um, from the year 2000 are now seeing that works again for the first time in North Miami in the retrospective. We're now going to move into the middle of the gallery space. You can see the drawings in the background. Um, simultaneous to Michael Richards creating the Escape Plan drawing series, as Alex mentioned, between 1996 and 2000, his work, uh, his sculptural work also significantly shifts again. By the mid 1990s, flight and aviation had become the central themes of Richards' practice. Uh, his artworks from this period took the form of sculptural airplanes and surreal winged appendages. He began to incorporate imagery from the Greek myth of Icarus, and he centrally began to engage the legacy of the Tuskegee, Tuskegee Airmen. Richards was particularly drawn to the duality of flight in his work, writing that he viewed, quote, the concept of flight as both freedom and surrender, end quote. The resulting sculptures and drawings, as you can see here, represent flight's possibilities of escape, reprieve, and transcendence, and its opposing potential for descent, conveying Richard's uh, real reverence for flight itself and also for its metaphoric capacity. Uh, and in this section, we're going to point to another recently conserved artwork, which is the Great Black Airman Tuskegee from 1996. Um, we can see it, yeah, here, it was on the right side of your screen from the back, and now we're looking at another angle of the work. Um, I'm also going to quote Richards on this work in particular. Richards described this work as a double-edged sword, quote unquote, saying, quote, the great black airman Tuskegee is in the form of a public monument. You see these bronze monuments in the park and you just walk past them, yet they're supposed to be the highest honor in our society. They're commemorating some great deed or person, but I have to question, is that what we're really fighting for? A piece of bronze in a public park that no one notices or cares about. The whole heroic ideal of glory that you're fighting for seems rather empty and banal when it comes down to that. With this installation, it gets ambiguous because Tuskegee is inscribed on the base. People assume it's referring to the Tuskegee Airmen, but it's also about the Tuskegee experiments. At the same time and place that the Tuskegee Airmen were getting their training, Black men were also being used in experiments to see how syphilis would progress through their bodies. So therefore, it's a destroyed and neglected monument." End quote. This sculpture, as Richards describes, directly engages the achievements of the Tuskegee Airmen, as well as the state-sanctioned anti-Black medical violence of, in the context of the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. With the toppled and winged torso in the work, Richards really complicates the recognition associated with sculptural monuments. He's invoking the uneasy duality of the moniker of Tuskegee. Therefore, the sculpture really implores the viewer to remember the triumph and not forget the atrocity. Of course, in our contemporary moment of a national and international reckoning with monuments, Richards engagement in 1996 with the complexities of commemoration feels ever more prescient and instructive. We'll now move from the flight and aviation section of the exhibition into the back of the exhibition space uh, with the section the Tuskegee Airmen, which is very much related. Um, the Tuskegee Airmen were a touchstone in Richard's artworks throughout the second half of the 1990s. Um, if we go to the next slide, we'll see the range of works. Um, so Richard spoke directly to the complexities of their legacy, stating at length, quote, the Tuskegee Airmen are a perfect metaphor because they were considered race men and were working to overturn all the myths and uplift their race. You would work twice as hard and be an example to your race. They were getting into those planes and flying twice as many missions as white pilots because they were standard bearers of their race. They had to be brave, no matter how heavily outgunned they were. It's also interesting in terms of the interior psychological dialogue that must have been going on with them, especially the fact that once they landed the planes and walked out, they could not eat in the same mess quarters as white officers. They had segregated barracks, yet they were fighting for the ideas of freedom, justice, and the American way. 
It's a very complicated metaphor and has a lot to do with my own questions about my place within society, working within society, making art, and basically making the culture of the society." End quote. So Tar Baby vs. St. Sebastian from 1999 is an especially powerful sculpture by Richards. He created the piece between studios in Miami and New York. And if we can go to the next slide, we'll get a, a frontal view of the work. Um, by 1997, Richards had begun casting sculptures from his full body instead of the fragments of his earlier work. For Tar Baby vs. St. Sebastian, Richards cast his body in resin, outfitted the figure in the uniform of a Tuskegee Airman, along with a helmet and parachute, and painted the figure a bronze, this bronze, bronze-ish gold. Artist William Cordova supported Michael in the fabrication of this sculpture, and has referred to Michael's process of creating sculptures that look like bronze, but are actually resin or bonded bronze, as an example of what William refers to as an alchemist at work. The artwork's title, Tar Baby vs. St. Sebastian, conflates two disparate narratives. Tar Baby is a fictional character based in African and African American folklore and popularized in Joel Chandler Harris's 1880 Uncle Remus stories. St. Sebastian was an early Christian saint and martyr. At a time when it was punishable by death to be Christian, St. Sebastian was bound to a stake as a live archery target. St. Sebastian is prominently featured in art history and depictions of the figure in agony with arrows puncturing his skin. Significantly, the planes that pierce Tar Baby vs. St. Sebastian are models of the US P-51 Mustang fighter plane that the Tuskegee Airmen themselves flew. In a sense, the American-built plane is attacking its own figure in an image of friendly fire, a metaphor for the contradictions inherent in American ideals of democracy and freedom, which at the same time function to exclude. Tar Baby vs. St. Sebastian exemplifies Richard's synthesis of a range of complex ideas in sculptural form. He's bringing together spiritual and historical references and opening up space for interpretation, contradiction, and meditation. Slide. Of course, in the light of the devastating circumstances that took Richard's life, the airplanes and pilot imagery in this sculpture take on an added prescience. This afterlife and interpretations of Tar Baby versus St. Sebastian in the wake of 9-11 are intense and powerful. When we started our work stewarding Richard's art, life, and legacy in 2016, Tar Baby versus St. Sebastian was one of the only works that circulated online about his practice. The connection of 9-11 to the imagery of pilots and planes in Richard's work had overshadowed other narratives of his art and his life. As a result, and in contrast, we worked really to center our discussions of Richard's art on the personal, political, and cultural issues he engaged and the ideas he expressed in his lifetime. In part, that's why the MOCA exhibition is so exciting because it's the first opportunity to contextualize Tar Baby vs. St. Sebastian alongside the full range of sculptures that Richards made about the Tuskegee Airmen throughout the mid to late 1990s. And we'll move on to discuss another of these sculptures. Actually, uh, this work uh, in the background you can see Tar Baby vs. St. Sebastian, of course, in the foreground is called Free Fall. And notably, it, uh, we believe that this uh, free fall is the first life-size figurative sculpture that Richards, uh, that Richards created, the first life-size pilot figure as well. And he created this work, we can go to the next slide, um, in New York City during a fellowship with Socrates Sculpture Park in 1997. So you can see here uh, on the left, you have the image from Socrates Sculpture Park in its original iteration. And then we have the, the sculpture itself on the right um, displayed in the museum. So this work also displays a pilot in a Tuskegee Airman's uniform standing atop a tiny landing at 10 feet in the air with a small bucket below him evoking the image of a diving board and a pool. And Richard's figure, of course, instead has a much narrower space for position, positioning his potential leap 
and also an impossibly small basin in which to land. Um, as with Freefall, Richard, and also Tarbaby versus St. Sebastian, actually, Richard's figures and sculptures were often pierced. Um, and in Freefall, you can see that the sculpture is riddled with nails. This is specifically a reference to Congolese and Kisi and Kondi power figures, as well as to the stigmata with the hands and the feet also pierced. And in this way, free fall is an exploration of diasporic identity, uh, bringing together references to both African ritual tradition and also African American history. Um, we also wanted to point out that importantly, this exhibition has offered uh, a really uh, important opportunity to not only show works in person, but also to share Richard's original vision and context for the works. Um, and it's demonstrated really excitingly here with this um, dual representation of the Socrates Sculpture Park installation, as well as the Brooklyn, uh, this sculpture Freefall, which is a generous loan from the Brooklyn Museum and kind of echoing what Alex said about showing Tar Baby versus St. Sebastian for the first time among the rest of the body of work relating to the Tuskegee Airmen. This is also the first time that we are showing Freefall, again, thanks to the Brooklyn Museum for this loan in this context as well, um, and also able to share such a large scale representation of its initial installation at Socrates Sculpture Park in Queens. And now moving to the back of the gallery, we'll talk about the title work of the exhibition. So this is Are You Down? And it consists of three identical downed pilot figures in Tuskegee Airmen's uniforms. Again, these figures are cast from Richard's own body here in multiple. And in speaking to the pilot imagery in his practice, particularly the Tuskegee Airmen, Richard's noted, quote, the pilots serve as a symbol of failed transcendence and lost faith, escaping the pull of gravity, but always forced back to the ground, lost navigators seeking home, end quote. It's really powerful quotes from Michael. Um, so you can see a little bit these pilots uniforms are tattered and they are each sinking into what appear to be pools of tar. Um, through their, though their expressions are serene or even stoic, you can also um, see pain and exhaustion in their faces and their bodies. So we can go to the next slide. Again, representing a different context here in the gallery, there is an outdoor version of the sculpture, Are You Down? Uh, in the outdoor version, the pilots are set in a 30, a 30 foot um, circle uh, in diameter, shimmering of shimmering black sand and surrounding a black and white target in the center. And in the indoor version of the sculpture, it's just the three figures um, sitting in the, what we believe to be pools of tar. Are You Down is uh, also along with Tar Baby versus St. Sebastian, Freefall and other works is a complex homage to the Tuskegee Airmen and also to the precarious liberation of flight. And unlike typical monuments to heroism, also of course referred to in the sculpture, um, we just described the great black airmen Tuskegee, um, which are often raised on stone pedestals, these heroes are rendered on the ground. And so rather than gazing upwards, one has to look down or even get down in order to engage with them. Richards originally created Are You Down in 1999 during his residency at Art Center South Florida, and the work was first shown at, in 2000 at the Corcoran Gallery of Art, and later that year at Franconia Sculpture Park, where Richards installed the outdoor version of the artwork, which you can see in the images in the background. In 2012, Franconia recast the figures in bronze, and now Are You Down also stands as the only permanent sculpture at the park. So this work is the title work of the exhibition, and um, it's Richard's dexterity with language, reference, and metaphor that is especially evident in his titles. And that is what drew us to this phrase and question as a title for the retrospective. In its most colloquial reading, Are You Down is a general inquiry. Uh, 
are you down in a more literal reading? Are you down may refer directly to the fact that these pilots are indeed downed or grounded. Or are you down as in they were down to take such a huge risk to fly in the face of injustice. And in each instance, the title additionally asks the viewer, are you down? We'll now move into the final section of the retrospective and ephemera. In recent years, Michael's close friends, his peers, and his colleagues have contributed immeasurably to a deeper and more complex understanding of his life and art two decades since his passing. Richard surrounded himself with an inspiring community of people in New York City, Miami, and beyond. And as part of our curatorial process over the last five years, we've spoken to over 100 people who knew Michael in his lifetime. We were so moved and inspired by these conversations, we've decided, we decided to represent the, some of these reflections about Michael, the space of the exhibition itself. We've quoted remembrances from 18 artists, curators, and collaborators, including Dred Scott, Franklin Sermons, Christine Y. Kim, Brooke Davis Anderson, Luis Gaspert, Lowry Stokes Sims, and more. These artists and friends share moving memories of Richard's generosity, his compassion, his commitment to his artistic practice. About half of the 18 reflections remember Michael's beautiful smile. We've included here two remembrances from William Cordova and Thelma Golden that we'll read give you a sense of the reflections in this space of the exhibition. From Thelma Golden, direct, director and chief curator of the Studio Museum in Harlem, he wrote to us, Michael Richards was a 1995-96 artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem and a beloved member of our artistic community. His work was profound and powerful, mining black culture and American history to create beautiful poetic objects that engage with the often tremendous contradictions between dominant historical narratives and African-American experiences. In his artist statement, Richard so acutely articulates the intrinsic humanity found in his work, when in describing his artistic mission, he writes, quote, I wish primarily to give voice to the psychic spaces in which exists both hope and frustration, faith and failure, and the compromises which must be negotiated in order to survive, end quote. While Richard's career was tragically cut short, our shared humanity continues on through his art and legacy. And artist William Cordova, who was a very good friend of Michael Richards says, quote, I owe much to Michael's friendship, wisdom and selflessness. Michael and I gravitated toward each other because we had similar family backgrounds and shared interests in history, art and culture. Sometimes we would sit at night in Miami under the dusty blue neon art center sign talking to eccentric folks at three or 4 a.m. David's Cafe was the only 24 hour Cuban cafe still around at the time as most Jewish, West Indian, Haitian and other local eateries had been permanently shut down. Our conversations always involved our family roots in the diaspora. His Jamaican, Costa Rican and my Peruvian lineage were as layered as our understanding that a label could not be so easily affixed in defining our identities. And last but not least, um, along with the remembrances, we've also included a pretty wide selection of ephemera from Michael Richards' art and life collected in three vitrines. Um, these are at the end of the exhibition and the materials include catalogs, invitations, press releases, documentation from exhibitions, and a lot of photographs um, that friends have shared with us as well as journals and sketchbooks. And so we just pulled a few examples so we can go to the next slide. So here you can see on the left, a contact sheet with images of Michael Richards, Shakaya Booker and Richard Lewis from their Studio Museum in Harlem Artists in Residence program, uh, generously from uh, the Studio Museum in Harlem archives, as well as uh, in the middle, an exhibition catalog from the 1996 exhibition, No Doubt, African-American Art of the 1990s. This exhibition was curated by Renee Cox and also included Cox as well as Kara Walker and Carrie James Marshall, among others. 
And on the far right is the exhibition invitation to Michael Richards' solo show at Ambrosino Gallery, as Alex mentioned. Um, and this features his childhood passport photo, which is signed by his mother, Mary Richards. And it's such a beautiful image. And so the next um, slide, we also included a section in this specific exhibition dedicated to Richard's time in Miami, which was just really vibrant and robust. And that includes these really special images of Michael working in his studio, um, working on the cast for Tar Baby versus St. Sebastian, as well as these really playful images with his Art Center South Florida uh, studio mates and uh, there's more uh, where all of this ephemera came from as well. And finally, there are newsletters, obituaries, and a rubbing of Michael Richards' name from the National September 11th Memorial. So together with the remembrances, these, we hope these materials provide a wide ranging picture of Michael Richards, the artworks he created, and the life that he lived. note. Between 1997 and 2001, Michael Richards' art practice flourished in many ways. He was awarded a fellowship and studio in Miami over three years. He was commissioned for two outdoor public artworks. He participated in group exhibitions that situated him as a leading voice in his generation. He had his largest solo gallery exhibition, and he was granted a studio in Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's World Use Program. Tragically, on September 11th, Richards was in his Worldview studio on the 92nd floor of World Trade Center Tower One, and his life was taken at the age of 38. As Richards' cousin Don Dale has poignantly expressed, quote, he wanted to say something to the world, but he's still saying it. His work is saying it for him, end quote. So beautiful. Um, so that concludes the tour and we wanted to thank you all again for being here. We are very happy to take some questions and we hope that you have questions, comments and thoughts. But before we do, um, we also wanted to note the next program coming up in June. Um, we can go to the next slide. So on June 16th, we're really looking forward to this program, uh, Michael Richards and the Whitney Independent Study Program. Uh, Richards participated in the Whitney Independent Study Program from 1992 to 1993, alongside artists Renee Cox, Lyle Ashton Harris, and Dred Scott, of course, among others, and the June 16th program will bring this group back together uh, and they will be in conversation in a conversation moderated by current Whitney Museum curator Rojeko Hockley. So please save the date, add it to your calendar. We'll put a link um, in the chat now to that event. Um, also stay tuned for upcoming uh, programming announcements. We'll uh, continue to have programming throughout the run of the exhibition and wanted to note that the exhibition is up through October 10th, 2020, 2021, um, which also means that it will really meaningfully mark the 20th anniversary of 9-11. On the occasion of this exhibition, uh, we are also excitingly co-publishing a monograph with MOCA and New York Consolidated. Um, so stay tuned for those details as well. And I think we're ready to move on to questions. We have a few questions that have come in. Um, I will start with, I believe her name is Daini Tapia. She asks, where will the works go after the exhibition? Sure, I'll start. So um, we're really thrilled that this exhibition is up for six months. Obviously, it's really exciting. Um, we do have hopes that it may travel, which would be um, very wonderful. And we will definitely keep everybody informed uh, if that opportunity comes up. Um, otherwise, the works go back to their lenders. And a lot, I don't know how much we said this, but 
uh, a majority of the sculptures that are in the exhibition are in the collection of the estate. And so those works will go back to storage in the estate until we have the opportunity to show them again. Um, the two uh, really great museum loans for sculptures are the Sculpture Winged, which comes from the Perez Art Museum in Miami, and the Brooklyn Museum Loan of Freefall, which we noted. And a lot of the drawings are in private and institutional hands as well. So uh, from artist Napoleon Jones Henderson, he asks, might you not position slash view the Tuskegee Airmen as the same as the Massachusetts 54th during the Civil War of the 1800s America, especially as it pertains to your observation of the Tuskegee Airmen not being accepted at the dining area and other facilities of white officers. Can you speak to, if you would, the relationship of these two situations as related to the American landscape regarding race and the white American psyche? Yes, thank you for the prompts, Napoleon, and thank you for your second comment here too. Um, I don't know as much about the Civil War history that you're bringing in, but appreciate your pointing to that history. So we'll do further research and, and try to think through the comparison that you're making with the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, I do think in terms of Michael's relationship to the Tuskegee Airmen first, um, I think that the sort of end of his quote where he says, that it, that has a lot to do with his own questions about his place within society, working within society, making art, and basically making the culture of society is an important um, detail of Michael's engagement with the Tuskegee Airmen. He's thinking about these questions of his own cultural production, his own artistic practice, and how they relate to these questions of sacrifice, segregation, um, in the context of of a end of the 20th century moment. Um, in terms of the white of white American psyche, I think the Tuskegee Airmen's relationship, um, I think the fact that when they returned from World War II into a segregated United States points to um, a white American psyche and the, the ways in which Black Americans, African Americans, um, the sacrifices that they make are not met with um, the possibilities that are embedded or embodied by an American ideal of democracy, which as Michael notes, is oftentimes as much about exclusion um, as it is in assimilation, as it is about inclusion. So um, happy to continue the conversation too. Um, from George Fishman, he says, congratulations on this extraordinary exhibition and thanks so much for your insights tonight. I just paid my first visit this afternoon and will definitely return to dive in deeper. Is the video available online? And what further plans do you have for the exhibition and for creating an online archive? Amazing, thank you so much for your visit and for being here tonight and for your questions. Um, the video I think you're referring to is the documentary and uh, we're so thrilled to have the documentary in the exhibition. There are future plans to make the documentary uh, more widely available, but they are to be announced um, by the directors and producers, uh, Dennis Wan, Marlon, and Ulite Arts. So um, again, stay tuned for that. And I think you also asked um, what other future plans are for the work. We talked a little bit about the possibility of traveling this exhibition. Um, and also making a monograph. So making a monograph is a huge, uh, has been a huge goal uh, throughout this process. And of course it feels really fitting that it would happen on the occasion of this retrospective. And so, um, so we are, uh, we've been working on the monograph and we'll definitely be turning our attention to focus on making the monograph over the summer. And as far as a web presence, also definitely hopefully uh, in our near future, maybe something that comes alongside the monograph, but um, yes, we really do want to be able to share um, all of the artwork and ephemera that um, has, uh, has resurfaced in these five plus years and that is being shown uh, at MOCA online um, as possible, so. I'll follow up really briefly just to note that we're really thrilled um, that one of the confirmed contributors to the monograph is Miami-based author 
uh, Edwige Danticat, which um, she wrote about Michael's practice in relationship to immigration in one of her earlier books. And we're um, very excited to have her voice in the publication. Um, also just in terms of a website, of course, Michael passing away in 2001 did not have his own artist website at that point. So as we noted in the tour, um, an online presence for Michael's practice, especially before um, the curatorial efforts that we've been undergoing for the last five years, um, his work really wasn't represented online. So an opportunity to create a website feels like a really important next step for the legacy stewardship to bring his practice um, to the digital space. So we're really uh, excited to think through that possibility too. So I've had a few questions come in asking about how you discovered or came about uh, being interested in pursuing this work um, and what drew you to be so dedicated to um, dedicating yourself so deeply to this legacy? I love that question. Should I start? Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so this could be a very long story. I'll try to keep it relatively brief and I know Alex will chime in. So um, for 12 years, as Shauna noted in the very beginning, I worked at Lower Manhattan Cultural Council. I started there in 2005. So of course was not there uh, in 2001 on 9-11. Um, we, neither of us knew Michael personally. Um, but uh, through LMCC and in, uh, in 2014, Alex started to work with me co-curating exhibitions, um, specifically for a space at the Art Center at Governor's Island and working on other projects. And um, we wrote a brief essay about Michael uh, for an online project that we were doing. And we were just immediately drawn in by his story, by his life story, by just learning a little bit about his artwork. Um, and also just realizing how underknown he was. And so we initially, um, the question was, is there work um, that we could create an exhibition with? And it was in 2016, really over a really brief period of six months that we put together the first exhibition um, that we created, which was called Michael Richards Winged. And it was uh, initiated at Lower Manhattan Cultural Council at the Art Center at Governor's Island. And that was really when we started uh, engaging in this curatorial process of, of course, uh, growing a relationship with Dawn, visiting the garage multiple times, as Alex described, visiting, I really, we talk about kind of following in Michael's footsteps. So going to the institutions that supported him during his lifetime, uh, the Bronx Museum, the Studio Museum in Harlem, Socrates, Franconia, among others who had kept files that contained sheets of slides and artist statements and correspondence and installation instructions. Um, and the research just really unfolded from there. And then multiple conversations, again, Alex just noted, you know, there was really not a significant online presence for Michael Richards when we first embarked on this project. And so everything was, you know, a tree of phone calls, you know, speaking with artists and curators, anyone whose name we read in an article, you know, we'd reach out to, um, we'd ask them, you know, who should we speak to next? And it has just been, uh, a, un, a very powerful unfolding process um, almost from day one and continues to unfold. Um, you know, as we noted, certain videos and artworks continue to resurface, images of works continue to resurface. And, um, and the work's really powerful resonance, as we've noted throughout the tour, um, you know, kind of personally, politically, uh, socially, culturally has really resonated, um, I think with both of us and also with his community and also with audiences who are encountering the work for the first time. And I'll hand over to Alex to keep talking about this. Yeah, I also think in addition to Melissa's histories with Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, at that time I was working for an organization in New York called Visual AIDS, which supports HIV positive artists and preserves the legacies of artists lost to AIDS. So I had a context in which I understood um, artists passing tragically and, and early on in their careers and lives. And also that a lot of times family and loved ones or friends were the people holding on to this material. 
So we had a sense intuitively um, from our experiences that hopefully there would be a body of work, though it wasn't something we could find online, there would be a family me member or a friend who would have taken care of this material. And um, really gratefully, Don Dale, as we've mentioned multiple times, um, just really um, is just at the heart of this project, um, stored Michael's work for with extreme care for 15 plus years, continues to. Um, I think also the Studio Museum in Harlem was a context in which inspiring exhibitions were taking place. And just to know Michael's institutional history with the Studio Museum in Harlem as an artist in residence there felt um, like this is an artist whose work um, was underknown and could be better known. And I just think also, I mean, on some level, cosmic level, Michael's been putting us to work for five years. Um, and that's to say that the, the dedication to his art is really comes from as soon as the work was being shown, we understood the power of these artworks. And also um, just to understand that that history and art history, uh, especially for an artist who passed at the age of 38 uh, in both tragic circumstances, could be lost, um, could fall through the cracks. And it really um, felt essential to, to try to care for this work and bring it back into circulation. Um, and also just the shows have kind of, in, in the relationship to Michael's own practice, the shows have kind of iterated themselves. We did smaller survey and gallery exhibitions um, and this MOCA show really grew out of um, and really allows us to expand on the wide range of Michael's practice. Um, the last point I'll make um, is that another Miami history is that a, the piece that another person in the chat has noted, which maybe I'll pass it over to Melissa to talk, to talk through, the artwork Winged um, was shown at Art Basel in 2017 or 16, um, following, the, following an earlier show and was actually purchased by the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, um, which is the first museum acquisition of Michael's artwork um, in recent years. And so that feels like a really significant moment in the legacy stewardship for works to be entering museum collections. Um, and my, Miami as a site for the sale of that work was really essential. So um, that's a dream and a hope is for work to continue to circulate and be placed. And um, it feels like it's just the beginning for that process. I will just also add that in terms of being compelled, I think that, of course, uh, I echo what Alex said, we certainly feel driven um, by Michael all the time, but also we've talked about his community so much. Um, there was just a tremendous outpouring from his community in our one-on-one -on -one conversations with people that we had over the phone leading up to the 2016 exhibition and beyond. Um, he was so beloved uh, as a person and admired as an artist by friends, peers, artists, and curators. Um, and uh, we also had a, a pretty incredible outpouring, I think, from press. The New York Times did a, a feature on the exhibition. Holland Cotter reviewed the show. They're just like the energy around him and his artistic vision has just been in, an incredibly powerful um, force. And I think, you know, that all comes together to this really passionate pursuit. Um, of his work. And I think that again, you know, not only are we thinking, you know, is his community such a large part of it, but also the community that's been created around the curatorial work and the legacy stewardship in the exhibition designers, conservators, preparators, the work just draws everyone really deeply in. And that is really clear. So, um, I think we've pretty much covered all of the questions. Um, just getting lots of wonderful feedback and thank yous. Um, someone did ask if there would be access to this recording. Uh, we will typically upload um, our programs to YouTube, so it will be accessible on uh, Mocha North Miami's uh, YouTube page. Um, but I think I'll go ahead and bring Shauna back on. Well, that was great. <laughs> thank you, Alex and Melissa. And thank you to our audience for joining us tonight. I hope that many of you have an opportunity to see this incredible exhibition in person. Uh, please consider joining us uh, this Friday for MOCA's Jazz at MOCA virtually, uh, which will feature Lando and the Infinite Sadness. 
And on May 5th, when we host a virtual tour with curator Dr. Elizabeth Shannon about our newly installed permanent collection exhibition titled, Our Beginnings Never Know Our Ends. Uh, this information and more can be found on our website. Thank you so much for joining us, Melissa, Alex. Thank you again for your time, your dedication, your spectacular exhibition. I know many, many will come to see it. Have a great night.